Back to Egypt now and the talking heads Egyptians call emperors. Every night, millions tune in to televised talk shows that focus more on politics than entertainment. The hosts of the programs lecture, opine, argue, rant, sometimes even cry their way through hours of airtime. Talk show hosts form a key filter through which Egyptians have come to view their politics, and they have an outsized influence on the masses. Under Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, talk show hosts are expected to legitimize his presidency and vilify his critics. When they do not, they have a habit of disappearing from the airwaves just like that. Television may be dwindling in importance in many countries, but in Egypt, where literacy rates are low, it remains the medium of the masses. And few institutions are more influential than the evening talk shows. The Listening Post's Tarek Nafa now on the highly politicized world of TV talk shows in Egypt. To say that talk shows are the most important phenomenon in the way that government communicates with the public would be an understatement. It's consistent, it's entertaining. You get the feeling as though you're sitting at a cafe with them. <laughs> and don't mistake it for a moment. This is not about bringing information to the people. This is about bringing the government discourse into your homes. Masters of distraction. Merchants of the absurd. In a country where more than a quarter of the population is illiterate, the spoken word has an outsized influence over public consciousness. The Egyptian love affair with talk shows began in the final years of the old regime, as Hosni Mubarak loosened his grip on the media. The hosts of these shows were colourful, opinionated, everything their monochrome counterparts on state TV were not. After the revolution, as state restrictions temporarily fell away, talk shows became a platform for lively, popular debate. The talk shows were always political. Now, they're deeply politicized, with hosts delivering a nightly diatribe that goes on and on and on. The monologue can be up to a half hour, in some cases 45 minutes, where you have a host not only talking, but working himself or herself up emotionally. Sometimes you would have uh, some very theatrical props. And the other thing is the interaction not only with the in-studio guests, um, but also with viewers at home. For example, we've seen relatives of some of the victims of the terrorist bombings where an audience member calls, begins crying on the air. And a host begins crying as well. And as a result, the host becomes this emotional link, this connection that brings people in their homes together. I can say at least 80% of journalists I interviewed in Asia told me that they see themselves to be first citizens and only second professional journalists. And there is a strong call for subjectivity within the journalistic community that perceives uh, the issue of the ideal of objective journalism as treason. The importance uh, of the personalities at play are beyond crucial. Without them, these shows would crumble. Two of them happen to be the power couple of Middle Eastern talk shows. Amr Adib is the first. He is very likely the most handsomely paid. He has a natural instinctive intelligence, and the intelligence agencies recognize that. His wife is Lamisa Hadid. She is a study in upper middle class decorum and delivers her message not as opinion, but as fact. 
البلوت واضحه القصه واضحه The third person that comes to mind is the most grotesque figure of explicit propaganda Ahmad Musa محدش يدور على فكر وانا اصلا نقعد نفند لا ما شاء Ahmad Musa is loud fascist non apologetic القوه هي القوه الحاجه الوحيده القوه والبتر He excels at a hyperbolically nationalistic form of diatribe that appeals to the lowest common denominator. Over the years, the format has survived, but the mission has changed. President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi took power in 2014 on a wave of nationalist fervor, vowing to return stability to Egypt, staking his legitimacy on combating terror. Talk show hosts presented the former general as a national savior who would stand between Egypt and the chaos that was consuming the rest of the Middle East. Hyping a shared sense of purpose, panic and victimhood. One of the key aspects of these talk shows is the way they whip up a sense of national emergency. You not only support the government, you bend over backwards, so to speak. So dissidents, political prisoners are typically vilified. They are portrayed as enemies of the nation. And if you portray anybody as an enemy of the nation in a time of emergency, what you're saying, it's okay to jail them, it's okay to beat them up, and in some cases, it's okay to kill them. Talk shows are a very prominent uh, political uh, tool or political platform for messaging. You need to support the regime because the regime is facing unprecedented dangers coming from the outside, but also and mainly from the inside. There is a conspiracy uh, coming from the Muslim Brotherhood. Despite they are under fierce crackdown by the regime, every critical voice uh, can be linked to the Muslim Brotherhood. The roster of the bad guys, real, imagined, and otherwise, is constantly evolving to suit the needs of the state. Qatar is now public enemy number one. Turkey is public enemy number two. Iran is public enemy number three. And, of course, the ruler is featured prominently, one way or another. There has always been a consistent awareness where the red lines are precisely. And right now, there are more red lines than there have ever been. Censorship is ubiquitous in Egypt and takes many forms. The government dictates the narrative and increasingly, the intelligence services are getting in on the act. Over the past year, they've secretly acquired almost all of Egypt's privately owned TV networks, having dispensed with media owners whose cooperation was never in doubt. It was only a matter of time before attention turned to the big personalities fronting Egypt's talk shows. This summer, some of the country's best known hosts who've played a pivotal role reinforcing President Sisi's rule, have paradoxically disappeared from TV screens. They include Lamith al-Hadidi, a loyal government surrogate who went on vacation in August and never came back. The regime in Egypt has emasculated all opposition. It has controlled the media to a level of 98 or 99 percent. They have muzzled civil society completely. And so you wonder, what is the remaining threat? Well, I think the reason these talk show hosts do present a threat is because the government is at a stage where it does not tolerate even indirect influence. It wants to have direct and immediate control over everything. You have to keep in mind that it all comes down to information, who has it and who doesn't, how it's delivered. Hats off to the CC regime for understanding the link between lack of education ease of dissemination 
obstruction of information. The government has created an environment where disbursement information, unless it is tightly controlled by government, is all but impossible.